day in First Thessalonians. We've been studying it for quite some time now. So if you've hated that sermon bumper, it's over. It's finally over. I want to just bring a couple of things to your attention before we get into the word. One is last week we started our elder cohort here at Provision Church. And that's really just, I don't, I don't know. I don't love the word cohort, but I love the idea of getting men together and working together to grow so that we might meet the qualifications of what the Bible calls for the church to have as elders, but also that um, we would grow in Christ. That's the main thing is that we would grow in Christ. And so we pitched that idea out a few months ago and had guys basically sign up or, or be a, say, hey, I'm going to be a part of that. And last week uh, we had over 20 guys in there. And I, just, I, I, I have derived a lot of encouragement from that uh, just to know that we're a part of a church that has men who are seeking to grow in Christ and want to serve the church well. So I hope that you are encouraged by that. And that will continue. That's a, a long process, a months-long process, so we're, we're really excited to continue that. I also just want to bring to your attention uh, our college students are on spring break this week. The, at least our wing at college students are on spring break this week. And so we're, we're missing them today. We'll miss them next week. But we have a conference that we, uh, like a spring retreat maybe is a good way of saying that that our college team has worked with the state convention to put on for these college students. And it's gonna be really, I think, impactful for these students. It's, it's a conference that's basically asking the question, where has God called me to live my life for him? And we're, I think we're sending, we're sending a good number of students. And as a part of what we're sending them to this conference for, we've said, hey, there's, it's, it's a pretty good deal. It's like $50 a student. So it's a pretty good deal for a weekend of food and instruction. But we've had a really good turnout and we've said, look, we don't want money to be in the way for you. We want you to come no matter what. So we've offered scholarships and we don't, we didn't really have like a scholarship fund, but we just said, <laughs> well, scholarship if you want to go. So I think we've got um, about $500 worth of need of scholarships right now. And so what I would, I'm just going to make this ask. Uh, I think there's probably someone in here who can probably write a $500 check to send college students to a retreat where they're going to grow in Christ. So maybe not, maybe that's not me. Like you could send one student. I'm not sure what your situation is, but what I'd like to ask you, if you're like, Hey, I would love to scholarship someone. Maybe just come talk to me after the service and just say, Hey, I'm interested in that. Maybe I can write one check for everybody. Or maybe I can write one check for one person. We'd be really grateful. We really believe that God's working at Wingate right now. And we really I think, uh, are looking forward to this conference as a moment to create unity in that group and then also send them back to campus and send them from campus back home or to wherever God has them going next on mission for him. As a part of sending people on mission, we want to send you on mission too. And you might have noticed that when you came in, you had this sitting in your seat. What I want to challenge you to do with this is take more than one. <laughs> take more than one and use it. We'll have these on your seats every week from now until Easter. And we, in our culture, I don't, people celebrate Easter. People, even people who aren't devout followers of Christ celebrate Easter. So it's a great point to leverage for your friends, those who are far from Christ, those who maybe ha love Jesus but have not been a part of his church. It's just a great opportunity for us to reach out to the people around us and have a simple way to invite them to hear the gospel. So maybe this card, we've made it a postcard, and the idea is that you could write an encouraging note and hand it to them or put a stamp on it and give it to them. But the number one reason people attend church or visit a church isn't because we have great social media or a website or, I don't know, good preaching. It's because someone gave them a personal invitation. So the idea of this is that you could make it personal, that you could go to someone and hand this to them, not oblivious to who they are, but carefully who they are. Um, so I'd love to ask you to consider planning towards Easter, inviting five people. Could you invite, invite five people to our Easter service between now and Easter? And you're like, Mark, Easter's a long way off. It's next month. So we just want to be, I want to put this in your mind, get you praying for it, get you thinking, who are you going to invite? So if you need more, if, you're, if you already know who your five are, there's more on the glass table back there. But I do want to challenge you towards Easter. We, we're a church on mission. We want to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. We want people to be saved and to be filled with all the fullness of God. And to do that, they need to hear the gospel. So I'm not saying 
give this to them and settle on them hearing the gospel at the service? They might. I mean, they will. They'll hear it if they come. They'll hear the gospel. But what if this is a way for you to ask them questions, to engage in the gospel with them through this? So I want to challenge you with that. But I also want to challenge you on Easter to make plans to be here. Make plans to be here. Make this make Easter an important part of your calendar. I think about at Easter, we're celebrating with family. Maybe for no reason or one reason or another, you're going to visit with someone else. What if you ask them to come visit you here? <laughs> what if you say, hey, come, come do Easter with me at Provision? So I'm asking you to invite five people. I'm asking you to make plans to be here, make sacrificial plans to be here. And I'm gonna ask you this too, join a serve team. On Easter, we do hope to have uh, an abnormally large number of people here. So we're going to need an abnormally large number on our serve teams. And I think serve teams are an incredible way to connect and engage in the life of the church. What we don't want for you is for you to just to show up on Sundays and leave and not be a part of the community and body. And serve teams are a really great way to connect with others, to get to know them, and to even show hospitality to believers and for those who are coming in who are not believers. So we want to ask you to join a serve team if you're not currently on a serve team. All right, what I want to do before we get into our, our time in the Word is encourage us to pray. So our, we know our, our students are out on spring break. Uh, I don't know about you guys, but the cultural perception of spring break is that it's not a time of righteousness for students. So we want to pray for their righteousness, their holiness, their pursuit of Christ, even when they're away from some of their normal rhythms of school. So let's pray for that for our students. We have our team that's planting in Elon. They're in Elon this weekend, meeting and pre prepping. So let's pray for them there. And then let's pray for Easter. Let's pray that God would give us, we put a prayer prompt on uh, your worship guide on your note-taking guide. Let's pray that God would give us confidence to invite others to know him. All right, let's, let's pray for those things. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for the opportunity to worship you together, that we get to be your people, that we're not random to you, that we're not uh, small or insignificant to you, but we are precious to you as your people, as your church, as your bride. Help us today as we come to your word, to come to your word with an open mind, a heart that is ready to be challenged by your word, that we wouldn't just be hearers of the word, but that we would be doers of the word. Now we know that uh, some of the students that are not here today, who we love and are thankful for, God, I pray that as they go home or go uh, on trips this week, even some who are still on campus, I pray that you protect them, that you guard their minds, you keep them uh, from their own evil desires and from the temptations from the enemy. And God, we ask for our team who's in Elon as they prepare to plant there and make disciples in Alamance County. God, I pray that you bless them, give them great unity and joy as they are together. Father, for us, as we aim to make disciples here in Union County, help us to leverage Easter God, thank you for giving us these natural ebbs and flows in life to be able to invite people in to knowing you with. So God, help us to be bold in that. Give us confidence to invite others to know you, whether that's inviting them to an Easter service or God, whether that's having that conversation by sharing the good news of what you've done for us. God, we thank you for the way that you love us. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. When we look at a passage together, like as we've done in 1 Thessalonians, my goal is to ask, what is the main idea of that passage? Every week we have this kind of main idea thing on our note-taking guide. And the goal of that main idea is, what is the main idea of the passage? How can we draw that down into a memorable takeaway from what this passage is saying? So we take the main idea of that passage and then we make that the main idea as we study that passage. So here's the main idea today. God completes what he starts. God completes what he starts. God completes what he starts, and that's a great comfort to us in light of our salvation. More specifically, that's a great comfort to us when we think about our sanctification and glorification. If God has called you, he will keep you. If God has called you, then sanctification, he's gonna grow you He's gonna help you be more like him and grow in Christ's likeness. 
and glorification he is going to take you to be with him. Let's look at the text. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23 and 24. Let's read that together. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Paul sets the example for us here in having certainty in Christ. Do you see that? The certainty in Christ. We're at the very end of this letter that was written to the Thessalonians, this church who Paul obviously felt a lot of. We see Paul, Silas, and Timothy writing this letter to them. He, he loves them and he's instructing them about the second coming of Jesus. That's a big part of this letter. You see a reference to the coming of the Lord throughout almost every chapter of this letter. And then he also writes them to encourage them in their faith. That's a huge part of this. So encouraging them in their faith, instructing them about the second coming of Jesus. And at the very end, he's hitting these key concepts once again. And in verses 23 and 24, he's both teaching them and really praying for them. He's asking God on their behalf. He asks the God of peace to sanctify them. See that in verse 23? Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. When we think of the God of peace, that's an interesting way for him to be referenced here. But it's a common description of God in the New Testament, a reminder of his work that God brings peace. He's the only one who can bring true peace. He may first bring the sword, but even the true work of that sword is to bring peace in the end. That's what Jesus did. Jesus even took the violence on himself, the sword on himself, so that he could make peace with us. As sinful people, we're each one sinful. As sinful people, our biggest need is peace with God. Our biggest need is peace with God. It's not morality or a perfect Bible reading plan. It's peace with God. And there's only one way to know God as the God of peace, to have peace of, with God. And that's through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. He is the only one. He is the only way. So when we reject Christ, when we reject Christ, we are at war against him. I know that can sound like hyperbole. Mark, you're just trying to make something sound bigger than it is. I don't think I can make this sound big enough. I think this is an understatement of our position towards God as we reject him and follow our own ways. As we say, God, your way is not good enough. I'd rather do it mine. When we reject him, we are at war against him. But when we turn from our sin and surrender to God, then we have peace with him. And it's the kind of peace in which he invites us to his table. It's not the kind of peace where it's like when you see each other in Walmart, you just don't make eye contact. This is the kind of peace where you get a long note in the mail saying, please come over for dinner soon. And then you get a follow-up text that says, come to my house and eat at my table. And then when you're at their house, it's a time of fellowship and sweetness that I love being with you. He invites us to his table. He invites us to be with him in his presence, in his throne room. We get to sit with him and relish his glory. I think about even the idea of being in his throne room, that we get to go to the throne of grace before God. I think about the story of Esther, where when she went to the king to approach him, she could have been killed for approaching him at all. And here we get the opportunity and the privilege to be in God's presence because of this type of peace that we get. He is the God of peace. We don't have to fight for our own position or authority, or our own personal value. We don't even need to worry about our next meal or about how we'll clothe ourselves because we have all we need in him, the God of peace. Because he is the God of peace, he desires to sanctify his people completely. That is, he desires to make us holy, to purify us, to set us apart for his work, for us to reject sin, to see sin for what it is as a rejection of him. And instead of rejecting God, we reject sin. 
The goal of sanctification is that our whole spirit and soul and body would be kept blameless. Do you see that in verse 23? This is the track and trajectory of the Christian life. Growing in Christ's likeness in every part of us. Spirit, soul, and body. Not that we have all these separate parts, but it's all of us. Our desire as we love God with all of our heart, soul, and mind, with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, right? that all of us mentality, as we love him with all that we have, our desire is that, we would, that he would grow us in his righteousness, that he would make us completely blameless. We share this hope. We share this goal, really, that Christ would grow us in blamelessness, that he would keep us blameless. And why? Right? Why does it matter? Like, why, You said, Mark, you just said we share this hope, but I've never really thought about being blameless as I've followed after Christ. Or I've thought a lot more about how good I'm doing at these things, or I've thought a lot about more about if I'm pleasing these right people, but I've not thought a lot about my blamelessness, but here you're saying that we share a goal with God of our blamelessness. Why does it matter? It matters because sin separates us from God. It draws our eyes off of him and distracts us from his beauty. When we make room for sin, we in, when we embrace sin instead of turning from it, it becomes nearly impossible for us to enjoy deep abiding fellowship with God. That opportunity to sit in his throne room when we sin is us walking out of the throne room because we say that throne's not good enough. I'd rather sit at another throne. In this life, sin robs us of our greatest joy, our greatest source of joy, of our great comfort and our great peace. Sin robs us of those things. It takes it away. Sin, in fact, offers those things. Sin offers comfort and joy and peace. Sin calls out as if it has those things to offer truly. Look at Proverbs 9. If you have your Bibles, flip over to Proverbs chapter 9. Proverbs chapter 9, and we'll, we'll be in verse 13. Sin mimics what is true, but can't provide what is true. In Proverbs chapter 9, here we get this instruction. I think this is a great way to understand sinfulness to understand sin, as we pursue blamelessness, as we pursue to not live in sin. Look at this description of sin. Proverbs chapter nine, verse 13. The woman named Folly is brash. She is ignorant and doesn't know it. I'm, I'm actually reading this from the NLT because I, I really love the way the NLT talks through this. But as your translation, the woman named Folly is brash. She is ignorant and doesn't know it. She sits in her doorway on the heights overlooking the city. She calls out to men going by who are minding their own business. Come in with me, she urges the simple. To those who lack good judgment, she says, stolen water is refreshing. Food eaten in secret tastes the best. Do you see what she's offering, this refreshment and this tasting of what is good? She's offering these things. Verse 18, but little do they know, those walking by hearing her call, little do they know that the dead are there. Her guests are in the depths of the grave. Sin offers refreshment. Sin offers joy and comfort and peace. But the more we accept the call of sin and give in to sin in our life, the more we are headed to the depths of the grave. Sin makes these promises, but in the end, sin leads to death. They are false promises with a real consequence. Not so with Christ. The call of Christ is much different than this. In Mark 8, 34, Jesus calls this way. This is what Mark 8, 34 says. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. This is the way that is blameless, that we take up our cross and follow after him, deny ourselves and follow after him. The way of the blameless is not easy. It's not always fun, but it is with Jesus. 
Do you see that call there? Come after me, be with me. That is the great goal of our salvation. The great treasure of our our salvation is Jesus. It's Jesus alone. That's who we want in our salvation. That's why we come to Christ is for Jesus. So many people embrace a version of Christianity because of what they want to get out of it. Whether that's affection from a spouse, a reunion with a loved one who's passed away, a deliverance from something bad in their life, freedom for guilt for something bad they've done. And honestly, In that, there are some great benefits of what come with following Christ. But those are nothing in comparison to the true gift of having Jesus, to get to be with him, to know him. That's what in our hearts that we might elevate and glorify Jesus above every other desire. That he might be the one thing. He would be our one thing. We don't achieve blamelessness. When you look at what's written here in 1 Thessalonians, God's word to us in chapter five, verse 23, it's not ours to achieve this blamelessness. God provides it. That's Paul's prayer. May he sanctify you and keep you. May the God of peace do this for you. Do you see that? It's not, may you work hard enough, may you not do enough bad things It's may the God of peace do this. We are so dependent on God. There's a, that's the lesson there. We are so dependent on God that in our work alone, we will never meet the requirements. May this God, may the God of peace sanctify you and keep you. We are in great need of God's grace. Without it, we cannot be blameless. The only way we can be kept blameless until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ is if God keeps us in his grace. And that is really good news for us. That's actually really, really, really good news for us. After all, our righteousness isn't in ourselves, right? We can never trust ourselves to keep blameless, but we can trust God to do it who is righteousness, who our righteousness is in. Because he is righteous, we trust him. Our righteousness is in Jesus. He saves us and he keeps us. He says it like this in John 10, John 10, 27 and 28. John chapter 10, verse 27 and 28. He said, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. Verse 28, I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. So that God completes what he starts. Our certainty is in Christ, that he completes what he starts, that he is faithful. He who calls you, is faithful. He will surely do it. He will surely do it. He is faithful. I can trust God. Look, you wouldn't surely do it. (laughs) You wouldn't, but Jesus does. We have certainty in him. I do want to give some warning here as we consider our certainty in Christ, that our salvation is won by him and is kept in him. There will be some who fall away. Some who claimed Jesus for their salvation and then reject him. We've, we've seen that. You may, have seen, you may have seen that in your personal life. You may have seen stories even of pastors who have proclaimed the gospel week after week from the stage and then later on reject that gospel that they once proclaimed. Some who claim Jesus for their salvation and then reject him. Is he not faithful to those? Did he not surely do it for those? Something would seem off there. It is true that there will be some who seem to follow Jesus, but were not saved. There were outward appearances and maybe even some inward feelings, but there was no transformation from death to life. 
There will be some. There will be those. 1 Timothy 4, 1 warns us of that. 1 Timothy chapter 4 says, Now the Spirit expressly says that in later times, some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons. It was like they, look, they looked like they were a part of this. They were with you. They came to church with you. They studied with you. But they were not saved. And they will depart from the faith. We must not place then our confidence in our salvation in a prayer we prayed years ago or a baptism once upon a time. Our confidence for salvation can only come from one place and that is in Jesus Christ alone. That Jesus Christ alone is our salvation. I trust Jesus for my salvation, that he has done the work, that he has died for my sin and that he has rose again. That is our confidence. That's our confidence for salvation. And the beauty of salvation in Christ is that he provides us with his Holy Spirit. So we're not just consumers of information about Jesus. Like we read the Bible as a Jesus documentary. Some of you guys have maybe seen these documentaries on History Channel as you're falling asleep, right? It's like, that. it's just information that I consume, but Jesus is not just information we consume, but he is God who dwells in us. The Holy Spirit is alive and at work in us, drawing us to himself, sanctifying us, making us holy, keeping us blameless. Our confidence for salvation is in Christ and our evidence continues in the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. So we have this great confidence in Christ and then we can look and say, is there evidence? Yes, the Holy Spirit is working, drawing me to him, keeping me blameless, helping me want to be like Christ. That is great evidence of the salvation we have in Christ. God completes what he starts. And he doesn't just do that in one of us or in isolation. He does it for his people. He does it for the church. Paul finishes this letter with a few brief but really authoritative instructions to his brothers and sisters in Christ. So let's look at these very quickly. Verse 25, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 25. He just said, look, may God keep you. May he grow you. He is faithful. He will do it. And he kind of really switches to this ending here. He says, brothers, pray for us. He uses here, depending on your translation, really the word there, brothers, is, is fine for brothers and sisters. So he's talking to this congregation. He's using this family language that he's used all throughout 1 Thessalonians as a picture of love and dedication to each other. He's saying, brothers, pray for us. It's a, it's a help for us to see that Paul wanted prayer too. That the, this apostle, these great disciples of Christ, these who were making disciples and moving and planting churches, that they didn't feel confident in themselves, but they also depended on Christ for their strength. Brothers, pray for us. We should be glad to have others praying for us. Sometimes we can feel intimidated by offering the, the, the need. Hey, I need prayer here. But as brothers and sisters in Christ, that's a way we get to serve each other. We follow Paul's example and say, brothers and sisters, pray for us because we're dependent. We recognize our dependent, dependence and we do, we gladly do. We pray for each other. The necessity and importance of prayer for the church. Here at the closing, he's saying, if I can ask one thing of you, because he doesn't ask a lot of them in this letter. A lot of it is how he's given of himself. And here he is asking of them. And what does he include? Pray for us. We must be praying for each other. Christians, we need people praying for us. And we need to be praying for others. Brothers, pray for us. Then in verse 26, greet all the brothers with a holy kiss. I, uh, I saw an interesting commentary on this and he said, we don't know much about kissing in the early Christian church. <laughs> I thought this is a pretty, pretty funny phrase out of context. But the truth is that he's not instruct, like there's no for us command to wholly kiss each other right now. But, but he is, hey, this is something that you guys do to show affection to each other. And so on my behalf, greet all those who are listening. Greet all those who hear this letter. Tell them how much I love them. There would have been some in Thessalonica, even in the church who would have doubted, is, is, are they with us? Like they left us, they haven't come back. They said, I want to be with you, I love you. Help them see how much I love you by greeting them with a holy kiss. There's something to be said here for the way that we encourage each other. 
that we encourage each other even with affection towards each other. And I'm not, again, I'm not encouraging a kiss here, but even something like a handshake does matter. Even something like a pat on the shoulder or a hug to tell someone that I love you and that you matter to me, that I care for you. That's the point here. He's saying, greet all the brothers with a holy kiss. Verse 27, I put you under oath before the Lord to have this letter read to all the brothers. Here is evidence for us that one, this letter is authoritative. What should we do with the word of God? We should proclaim it. The word should be proclaimed. That's what he was saying to them. Don't hide this. Don't keep this to yourselves. I'm telling you before the Lord, putting you under oath, read this letter to everyone in the assembly, to all the brothers and sisters in the assembly, read this letter. That's our model. That's what we do here. We read the word and and then we talk about it. We exposit it. We open it up. We expose the word. We say, this is what the word means. So we sit under the teaching of the word and that's what he's asking for there. I put you under oath. That's a strong, a strong language. In his, in his ending of this letter, he could have been really sweet and gentle, but instead he's very authoritative. I put you under oath. Don't not do this. Make sure you read this letter to them because this is the word of God for you. So church, that's what we do when we gather. There will never be a time when we gather together corporately where we're not opening and exposing the word of God. That's our goal as well. So the importance of the word of God, the importance of what he has to say to his people. And then verse 28, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. It's a succinct, simple ending, but it's an ending even as we come to the end of these New Testament books, as we've done several times. And we get to this, I think about you, church. I think about us. And what is the best blessing that we could have? As we think about our salvation in Christ and our remaining blameless in him, that he's the one who saves us and keeps us. What is the best blessing for us? Is it not that you would have and be covered with his grace? Grace to you, that you would know the grace of Jesus. You would be covered in his grace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. It's a simple ending, but it again positions what is so important to them. That, it, that you would know and understand who Jesus is by his grace. Brothers, pray for us. Greet all the brothers with a holy kiss. I put you under oath before the Lord to have this letter read to all the brothers. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. These are instructions for siblings in Christ. Really throughout this entire book of 1 Thessalonians, this entire letter of 1 Thessalonians, it's clear that Paul's instructions were given to siblings in Christ. It's a special thing that we might be able to pray for our brothers and sisters, that we might be able to hold our brothers and sisters, that we might be able to read the word with our brothers and sisters, and that we might be able to enjoy the grace of God with our brothers and sisters. And truly, that's what we should be. And it's a constant work in progress for us, isn't it, church, brothers and sisters, that we might be able to look and say, you're my brother or you're my sister, and not just make that some type of organizational language that is meant to convey an idea that we don't actually practice, but that we want to be these people. So what are the steps we take? Well, the steps we take are listening to the word of Christ, listening, uh, praying for each other, greeting each other, that we care and have concern over one another. But we should be able to, have this type of ending on our letters to each other, that we might be siblings, that we might truly be siblings in Christ. And we are, if we've been saved, we truly are siblings in Christ because Christ completes what he starts. So he, he has saved you, he will keep you, and someday he will return. Isn't that the message of, of First Thessalonians really in, in total? Is that our hope is a living hope in a savior who will return. You've heard me say today, if you're here and you're not a Christian, you've heard me say that we have a problem and it's sin and that we need a savior and it's Jesus. He rose from the dead. He is alive and he is coming again. And so my my encouragement to you today, if you're not a believer, is don't hear these words and let them pass over your ears and gloss over them and continue with your day as normal. If you're here and you're not a believer, submit to the authority of God's word. Turn to Christ. Receive him as your savior. If you're here and you are a believer, what do, you, what do you do with this? What do you do with this passage if you are a believer? 
If you are a believer, here's what you do with this passage. You continue analyzing the evidence of the Spirit's work in your life. You continue turning to the confidence you have in Christ day after day after day. Something we say and maybe uh, gets oversaid is we should preach the gospel to ourselves. We should continue reminding ourselves day after day the goodness of what God has done. That he has shown us incomparable generosity and kindness by sending Jesus to die for our sins and rise again. And not just making that it, but then dwelling with us, inviting us into intimacy with him. We have that gift. Let's today not leave here with just being hearers of the word. Let's be doers of the word together. If you want to talk about any of this, I'm going to be at the back and I'd I'd love to talk with you through becoming a Christian, following out our certainty in Christ. So come and see me. We're going to uh, continue worshiping through song. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the way that you have given us your word. Here as we finish 1 Thessalonians, we're grateful that we're not done with 1 Thessalonians, but we're done with the series. We continue coming back to your word day by day. God, for us, as we consider that you complete what you start, God, help us to have certainty in you, that we wouldn't live life confused or uncertain about your kindness towards us, that we wouldn't live life confused about where we'll spend eternity, that we would be confident in you. God, you've given us this confidence because we can trust your word, because we know that you came, that you lived a life that we couldn't live, that you died a death that we deserved, and you rose again. God, you defeated sin and death. We praise you for this. As we continue to sing, I ask that you would help direct our hearts and our minds our whole selves to loving you, to enjoying you. God, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.